Am I on? Okay, just making sure because I think the last time you guys heard from me, um, I was backstage uh, baptizing and I had a hot mic on and uh, I was just talking while Pastor Steve was pr- trying to preach and it's a little awkward, but um, it's all right. I think I called myself a knucklehead or something and um, yeah, so if you were here for that, you experienced that. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Matt Downing and I get the awesome privilege of working with these guys right here, our students, and I love it. Um, Um, It is a joy and a privilege, and I'm thankful for a pastor that allows uh, us the opportunity to preach, um, uh, the the staff. Um, You know, there are churches uh, all over the convention where they set aside one Sunday for the youth pastor to preach, and it's the last Sunday of the year when they know that most people will be gone uh, and on vacation, and so that's like the youth pastor, uh, youth pastor preach day, and so... uh, I was awesome to be able to share with a friend of mine, hey, you know, our pastor allows us to have opportunities to preach a little more often than that, and so I'm privileged to get to be able to do that today. Um, we're continuing our series called Self-Identify, and we are in the book of 1 Peter. Let me ask for you to turn there um, so you can follow along today. You can follow along on the YouVersion app, or you can follow along in an actual physical Bible. They still have those and make those and uh, love it, love it. Um, but First Peter chapter 4, um, we're going to uh, look today at uh, what, what another quality or characteristic that Christ has called us to. Pastor has done a great job over the last several months of, in pointing out some different characteristics of the Christ follower. Um, he's, he's talked about how we are to be recipients of new hearts because of Christ's salvation within us, uh, how we're to be holy, how we're to be different, how we're to be honorable, how we're to be humble, how we're to be mature, and how we're to be followers. Today we look at another characteristic of the Christ follower, and we look at the importance of being ready. Let me ask you, what are you ready for? Are you, uh, maybe you're a teenager and you are ready to drive. You're ready to have your car, ready to, to have that freedom. Maybe you're ready to have the freedom of being out of the house finally. Or maybe you're a parent of that teen who's ready for that as well. Um, you love your kids, but you're ready for them to uh, quit acting like I know everything and to experience what life is like in the real world on their own, right? Um, I don't know. Uh, but for me, as, thinking through my life and the things that I thought I was so ready for, uh, it turns out I wasn't quite ready. When I was a teenager, being excited, being ready to finally drive and to finally be able to have that freedom of, of being um, out on the road in my mom's car, uh, 1984 Cutlass Cruiser station wagon. Um, that's what we had, right? But uh, I, I thought I was ready. And, you know, I, I, first time I'm in there, I'm, I, I pump up the music. Of course, once I get down the street away from my mom's house, so she can't hear it, my mom, mom and dad. But I, I crank up the music and I'm playing it. And uh, it just, like, yes, finally I have this freedom. Only for about a month or two later to have my first accident with the car. And the accident happened in a parking lot as I was just turning into park and I didn't turn quite enough and went into the car. And the person that owned the car was out there to see it and freaked out. So I wasn't quite ready for the freedom of having a car. Or maybe in college, I, I thought I was ready, ready for, to, to learn, to grow. I knew God was calling me to ministry, but I, I was just, I was ready for more. And to not do so well on my first test, um, to, to think to myself, okay, maybe I should have not just uh, taken notes, but actually read um, the, you know, the syllabus and the textbooks I was supposed to read. Or um, in marriage, you think, yes, I am ready to be married. And then you, uh, you start to do life with your spouse. And I begin to, to see that the bathroom and, and all these things that are starting to take over the counter, um, you've, you've got... Like for, for guys, we just got a couple things, right? And, and we're, we're ready. And it, but to see, oh, what, what is this? Okay, this is, uh, this is lotion. Uh, these, the jewelry here. Okay, this is body spray. And here's, here's the straightener to straighten your hair when you don't want it curly. Or here's curlers to curl your hair when you want it a little more curly. And, um, or, I didn't get her permission to share this, by the way. Um, sorry, Mel. 
Or when you, you, go, you go somewhere for the first time and, and you know, as a guy, you, you take a few minutes to get ready and you're waiting on her and she's not ready because she's using all those things that were on the counter, right? And so you're, you're waiting um, to be ready and she's not quite ready yet. Or, or maybe it's you, you were excited and ready to, to have a child and, you know, you, the, the, the child comes and, and you're excited and we have our, our first son, Caleb, and just being excited that, yes, he's finally here. And then the first night home from the hospital, he kept us up the entire night. And finally, we, he, we got to fall asleep. He finally fell asleep. We were, we were having to hold him just in a certain way, hoping, okay, he's finally asleep. Now we can sleep too. It was like four or five in the morning. We thought we were ready. And come to find out, we, we weren't fully ready. And in life, maybe for you, 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 there's things that you have looked forward to and you're ready for. Maybe you're, you're ready for retirement. Or maybe you got to retirement and realized that this isn't what I thought it would be. I don't know. But we, we are called to be ready. And it's hard to know how to be ready sometimes. So today we look at the importance of what it means to be ready for Christ's return. And uh, if you will, join with me in 1 Peter chapter 4. Um, this is verses 7 through 11. Now the end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious and disciplined for prayer. Above all, maintain an intense love for each other, since love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Based on the gift each one has received, use it to serve others as good managers of the very grace of God. If anyone speaks, it should be as one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, it should be from the strength that God provides, so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. You know, in the first part of that passage where Peter shares that the end of all things is near, do you ever have those days where you are just ready? You are ready for Jesus to come back because you're just... You're sick of, of things in this world, and you're sick of, of having to, to, to listen and experience some of what's out there, and, and just life gets hard. Just, you're ready. You're ready for it to end. Don't you know that the early Christians were experiencing um, that, but in a, in a completely different way? We don't know a lot about persecution yet in, in this country. Some, but compared to what other Believers all over the world are experiencing being separated from families, even death. And the early Christians have to experience that same type of thing, where they're scattered throughout Asia Minor, scattered throughout Rome. You know that they were ready. They were ready for Christ to come back. They were ready to be done suffering. But Peter encourages them, and he starts there by telling them, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious and disciplined for prayer. So, was Peter wrong? I mean, here we are 2,000 years later, and, and Christ hasn't come back. No, I don't believe Peter was wrong, because I don't believe God makes mistakes. And so as God leads Peter to, to share this, even Peter himself knew that there were, there were things that had to happen before the end could come. Peter had, had heard Jesus share about the, the signs of the end, the, the plagues, the famines, the wars, the rumors of wars. He knew that Jerusalem would be destroyed. He knew that he himself when, when he was old, he would be uh, hung upside down on a cross. He knew these things were coming, so he wasn't just telling the, the early Christians, hey, just, just hang on, Christ can come tomorrow. Could he have come that next day? Of course. But what he was telling them is just, just hang on, because God's time is different than ours. We know that, right? We know that uh, with, with the Lord, in a, a, year's like a, a, thousand, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. And, and God can do things however and whenever he wants to. Before Jesus ascended into heaven, his disciples asked him, they said, are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus told them, it's not for you to know when that's going to happen. So Peter is not trying to make a prediction. He's telling them that just be patient. Know that this, this time of suffering is just a brief period of time. Christ will come and, and he will restore What's been made right? You'll be with him. The suffering will be over. The end of all things is near. Therefore, devote yourselves 
Be serious and disciplined for prayer. So what do we do as we strive to be ready for Christ to come back? We say we're ready for it, but are we really ready for it? And what does that look like? Does that mean we, we become fanatics and, and we, we paint up a sign that says the end is near and wear it on us and, and go out and tell people that, that doom is coming? Or do we, do we find a different way to live? Well, I believe we find a different way to live. And, and Christ has, um, has given us certain things that we can be doing in that time. So if you're following along with me, if you're taking notes, I want to encourage you to write this. We live ready for Christ's return. What does it mean to be ready? It means we, we live ready for Christ's return, knowing that it could happen at, at any point. So what do we, how do we live waiting for his return? Well, the, the answer to this, part of the answer to this, is found in what we talked about last week. You understand that, that when Peter wrote 1 Peter and, and the, the, the writers of scriptures, they're not, they're, not writing in, they're not writing with the little verse numbers beside it, right? They're not writing so that, that pastors 2,000 years later will take, okay, take this chunk, and then take this chunk the next week. He's, he's just writing this as a letter. And so going back to the beginning of chapter 4, Peter gives instructions. Peter gives guidelines on how to live. And going back to that, in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, equip yourselves also with the same resolve, because the one who suffered in the flesh is finished with sin, in order to live the remaining time in the flesh no longer for human desires, but for God's will. For there has already been enough time spent in doing what the pagans choose to do, carrying on an unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and lawless idolatry. So they are surprised that you don't plunge with them in the same flood of wild living, and they slander you. They will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. So we have to live ready for Christ's return. First of all, we focus on his desires rather than our own. We choose to pursue holiness rather than choose to go the way that the world is going, we say, wait a second. That's not right. God has called me to a different way of living. I'm not supposed to be involved in those things, but I'm supposed to live a holy life. I'm supposed to have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. I'm supposed to arm myself with the, the, the same attitude and the same heart of Jesus. That means I live differently. We ask God to help us avoid the danger of falling so in love with the world that we become spiritually dull. I love how Pastor shared this last week that, you know, that, that when we choose not to go that way, and, and it will surprise people. They'll wonder why. What, what's the matter with you? Well, why, why, don't you why, why don't you do the things that everyone else is doing? The last several weeks, we've been in a series with our students called The True Love Project, encouraging them to pursue God's purity for their life and for their future spouse. And one of the things we talked about today is knowing that when we do that, the rest of the world is not going to understand because the rest of the world is, is not waiting. The rest of the world is doing something completely different. But as Christ followers, we're called to live holy and set apart and pure. So how do we live ready for Christ's return? It means we focus on his desires rather than our own. We pray for God's strength to endure and escape the trap of spiritual apathy. And when we pursue the things of the world, we begin to become spiritually dull, where we begin to, to love the world more than we love our God. We begin to, to seek our desires rather than his desires. And Peter's saying, don't do that. Look, look to Jesus, pursue Jesus, love Jesus. Focus on his desire rather than our own desires. He also says this, focus on our Savior rather than our sin. Focus on our Savior rather than our sin. So, so rather than beat ourselves up for, for mistakes we've made, we focus on the fact that, that now we can begin again, that Christ has forgiven us, and we begin to, to live ready for Christ's return because we're not focusing on our sin, but we're focusing on our Savior. We remember that anytime we're tempted to sin, that our sin costs Jesus his very life. And we stop and we say, wait a second, if I do this, then I'm giving in to that. I, I'm, I'm making what Jesus did for me, I'm, I'm, I'm cheapening that. Instead, we, we live a, and pursue a holy life, focused on what God has for us. We focus on our Savior rather than our sin. 
Let me tell you, Peter knew this firsthand. You see, Peter's not just writing a letter to the early church saying, hey, these would be some great things for you to do. Here's some suggestions. Peter was actually there with Jesus. Peter was closer to Jesus than than probably any other disciple, except for John, maybe. Peter is, he he lived with Jesus. He walked with Jesus. He saw Jesus show compassion. He saw Jesus heal. He heard Jesus teach. And his life was forever changed by Jesus Christ. In fact, when Peter sinned against Jesus, denying him three times, Jesus gave him another chance. And so Peter knew better than anybody what it meant to live ready for Christ's return, meaning that we focus not on our mistakes, not on our failures, but we focus on our Savior. We focus on what he did for us, and we seek to live rightly. Living ready for Christ's return means that we remember that all we have, we all will have to give an account for how we lived our life. Again, Pastor shared this last week. What this means is that we will have to answer one day for what we did or did not do for Jesus. So if we choose to follow the way of the world, if we choose to go the way that culture seems to go, then we're denying our responsibility and our opportunity to follow Jesus and to portray someone who is changed by Christ. And we will have to give an account one day for what we did, what we didn't do. Not only that, but we will also have to give an account for who we did not share with. The people all around us that we, we choose to ignore or we choose not to share with, the people that you're close to that maybe have an opportunity to share but we don't take those opportunities, we'll be held accountable for that. So what that means is that we look and we remember that, as Pastor said last week, there will be a payday for us and for them. And if we have the opportunity to share the truth with them and we don't do it, we're not only missing an opportunity, but we're, we're gambling with their eternity. It means we're to be broken. Living for, ready for Christ's return means we're to be broken for those who don't know him and will spend eternity without him. So we think of those people in our world, that, that even in our, in our sphere of influence, the people that we see and are around every day, we think, it, it, who's going to share with them? If Christ has put me in this, in this place for this time in history, I'm in this school, I'm at this job, I work with these people, then he's called me to be a light and called me to be a minister. God, what do I do with that? Well, it means you, you begin by praying. You begin by saying, God, show me. Show me how to minister. Show me, show me how to, um, help me not to miss opportunities. Open my eyes and help me to see what you want me to see. So living ready for Christ's return means that that we have a brokenness for people around us. Second thing, though, is living ready for Christ's return means that we love, ready to show Christ's character to the world. We love, ready to show Christ's character to the world. 1 Peter 4, verses 8 and 9. Peter says, Above all, maintain an intense love for each other, since love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. So what's it mean to love ready to show Christ's character? Well, first of all, we love even when it's hard and not deserved. We love even when it's hard and not deserved. As a kid, if you grew up in church, you heard that the two greatest commands, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbors yourself. And you're like, okay, that's, that sounds easy enough. And then you got to be a little older and you realize that's not easy at all, Right? Because we're, we're called to, to love people and we begin to, to have people come into our lives that are difficult to love. People that, that may say mean things about us or do mean things to us or to our kids or people that we just don't get along with or people that it just seem to clash with time and time again. Peter's saying part of being ready is loving them even when they may not deserve it, even when it's hard. Love covers a multitude of sins. So when someone has wronged you or offended you, rather than focus on that, you begin to focus on love and say, okay, i got to choose to love, i got to choose to move past my bitterness or my frustration. And sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that's really hard. No, no, let's just be honest. All the time that's really hard, especially for people that, that we may be close to, that we know and love, and maybe they hurt us. And we've got to make a choice in that 
does my love for them really run deep enough where I can choose to move past that? If love covers a multitude of sins, can I get past my frustration? Can I get past what they did to me and can I still love them? That's hard. It's impossible, honestly. But the only way we can do that is by having the spirit of the living God in us. The only way we can do that is by remembering what Jesus did for us, the fact that he went to his death for us, that he, he loved the church so much that he gave himself as a sacrifice for the church and how he calls like husbands to love your wives just as much as Christ loves the church and offered himself as a fragrant offering, as a sacrifice. That is love. That is sacrificial love. So hard to do, impossible to do. But when Christ is living in us, When we're focused on our Savior rather than our sin, we're able to begin to love in ways that we didn't think we could. So we love even when it's hard and not deserved. We love even when it's not returned. Loving like Jesus means we stoop down and we lift up the broken. We make sure that the last in line are treated like the first. We give the most favor to the least likely. So if someone hurts you and and you think, you know, I'm going to choose to love them and they don't love us back, we hate that, right? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying here, but you're not trying. Well, that's what true love is. You push through, you fight through, because love covers a multitude of sins. Loving may mean we, we ask for forgiveness even when we feel like we haven't done anything wrong. But that's part of what love is. We don't feel like we need it, but we do it because we want to be right. We want to show love. Loving like Jesus means we reach out and forgive even when it's not asked for. Loving like Jesus also means we love even when it may not profit us. I want to show you this, the, the part of this verse here. It was interesting to me. In uh, 1 Peter 4, 9, Peter's saying be hospitable to one another without complaining. That word hospitable, that, the, the Greek word there, is used to refer to people who um, are strangers. So he's not just saying love the people that are in your life and, and that you're close to or that you work with. He's saying Love the people that are hard to love that you may not even know that it may not even profit you to love them. But you don't, don't just love them, but you show hospitality to them. For the early church that may, they have, that may have been a pastor or a preacher coming through and, and them opening their homes to this preacher they didn't even know. Or, or, or showing, showing hospitality in, in, in ways maybe they weren't prepared to do. And have you ever noticed that Sometimes we're asked to love and it's not convenient for us. In fact, most of the time, right? We're, we're called on to do something and, and to show love in a way, but it's like it's not a great time. You push through that and you say, hey, you know what? It's not my time. Okay, it's, it's, not, it's not my time, God. It's your time and you've called me to do this. I'm going to do this. And we choose to focus on God's love rather than our convenience. It means to love strangers, not just tolerate them. It means we hang out with those who have nothing to offer us. It means we love even when it's inconvenient, even when it's hard. C.H. Spurgeon said this, We are to love our neighbors as ourselves, but we are to love our fellow Christians as Christ loved us, and that is far more than we love ourselves. Think about that. Love our neighbor as ourselves, but Christ loves us far more than that. He went to his death for us. He gave up his life for us. And he calls us to do the same, even when it's hard, even when it's inconvenient. Here in about a month, our students, uh, we have an activity, uh, an event coming called the 30-Hour Famine. And uh, we are challenging our students to go for 30 hours without eating to help them understand what children all over the world have to go through. They're not being enough food or clean water. And part of the goal in this is for them to spend the next 30 days praying and saying, God, how can I get involved? And then raising money to help go towards children all over the world who need help, who need medical attention, who need food, who need clothing, who need water, partnering with World Vision. But that's an opportunity that our students are going to have to show love. It's not going to be convenient. We would rather have pizza and talk about it rather than to go hungry and talk about it. But going hungry helps us to realize, oh, This is what it's all about. This is what they're having to go through. Philippians 2, 3. 
Paul tells us to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. That is not easy to do. To live as if we are putting others before ourselves. But it's what Christ has called us to do. So part of being ready is living ready for Christ's return, loving, knowing that that's how we show God's character to the world. And lastly, we serve. Ready to fulfill Christ's commission to reach the world. 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11. Based on the gift each one of us received, use it to serve others as good managers of the very grace of God. If anyone speaks, it should be as one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, it should be from the strength God provides so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. So what's that mean to serve, ready to fulfill God's mission to reach the world? Well, it begins by understanding what our mission is and going back to the Great Commission, the cause that we're to all be about, not just the disciples, but we're to all be about, found in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, where Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you to the very end of the age. We've been given a cause, a commission from our King to not just love, but to serve. To not just say we love, but to show we love. We understand that we've each been given a spiritual gift to benefit the kingdom now. Do you all know that? Do you you understand that every person, the moment that you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you were given a spiritual gift? You may not know what that gift is. But you were given that gift for the purpose of edifying the church to accomplish the mission to reach the world. And so every single one in here who has given a life to Christ was given a spiritual gift. I'm going to share some of these with you. There are several passages where where Paul talks about this, but I want us to look at Romans 12, verses 6 through 8. Paul shares this, that having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If it's prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. When it comes to just talking about the spiritual gifts, we typically mean the motivational gifts of the Spirit. These gifts are practical in nature and describe the inner motivations of the Christian servant. I'm going to walk through these real quick because maybe you've never taken the, the time to do like a spiritual survey or no one's ever walked you through that as to what your spiritual gifts are. But as I share some of these with you today, maybe you hear and you think, yeah, that's, that's me. That, that's, that's kind of how God has equipped me. You may have the gift of prophecy. Prophecy, those with prophecy are the eyes of the body of Christ. They have insight and foresight and act like watchdogs in the church. They warn of sin or reveal sin. They're usually very verbal and may come across as judgmental and impersonal. They're serious, dedicated, and loyal to truth, even over friendship. Or maybe you have the gift of ministry, of serving, helps. That means you're the hands of the body of Christ. You're concerned with meeting needs. You, you're highly motivated. You're doers. You may tend to overcommit, but you find joy in serving and meeting short-term goals. Or maybe you have the gift of teaching. If you have the gift of teaching, you are the mind of the body of Christ. It means you realize that your gift is foundational. You emphasize accuracy of words, and you love to study. You delight in research to validate truth. Maybe God's given you the gift of giving. You are the arms of the body of Christ. You enjoy reaching out and giving. You're excited by the prospect of blessing others. You desire to give quietly in secret, but will also motivate others to give. Maybe you have the gift of exhortation or encouragement. You are the mouth of the body of Christ. Like cheerleaders, you encourage other believers and are motivated by a desire to see people grow and mature in the Lord. You're practical and positive and seek positive responses. Maybe you're an administrator. If you're an administrator, you are the head of the body of Christ. You have the ability to see the overall picture and set long-term goals. You're good organizers and you find efficient ways of getting work done. Lastly, maybe you have the gift of mercy. Those that have the gift of mercy are the the heart of the body of Christ. They easily sense the joy or distress in other people and are sensitive to feelings and needs. They're attracted to and patient with people in need, motivated by desire to see people healed of hurts. Let me show a quick video which helps illustrate this a little bit more.
that is a reminder to us that part of living ready for Christ's return means that we live in expectation, we love the way Christ loves us, and we serve because we know we've been called to do that. We don't just show love. We don't just say we love, but we show we love. I love how Jesus, in his time on this earth, he didn't just meet physical needs, but he met the spiritual needs as well. When he healed someone, he led them to a deeper understanding of who they really were and their need for him. And for us, when we do good works, when we serve, part of that is not just doing, doing the thing that, we've, that we're there to do, but it means sharing the next part of that. Here's why we're doing it. If we're not sharing the, the reason for the hope that we have, then it's just charity work. But when we share the reason for the hope that we have, when we share the gospel, when we share Jesus, we're showing that we're not just here to do charity work, we're here to show that we love. And that's what Christ has called us to do in these, in these last days. In spite of what's going on in our world, in spite of, of, what, uh, of what wars or rumors of wars or plagues or coronaviruses or whatever, God tells us, trust me. In this time as you have, don't freak out, but trust me. Trust that I'm calling you to, to love and to serve, and let's, let's reach the world to go into the world and to make disciples of all nations. And I love this because Christ doesn't just tell us to do it, but he gives us the power and the strength to do it. We saw that in, 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 the, in Matthew where we heard Jesus' words in the Great Commission. He says, I'm with you to the very end of the age. In Acts 1.8, Luke shares it this way. He shares, you will receive power. Jesus is saying this. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. We are God's plan A for reaching this world. There's not another plan. God, God knew that he wanted to use his church to do the work, to reach the lost. I don't know if you know this or not, but um, and I was reading a study where it says by 325 A.D., so about 260 years after Peter wrote his letter, about 290 years after Jesus was on this earth, um, scholars predict that uh, in the world, the church was estimated to have 7 million Christians and 2 million martyrs. This is a report done, I believe, by uh, Dallas Baptist University. 7 million Christians. How in the world did Christianity grow from a pocket of believers that Jesus challenged into seven million people worldwide in just three centuries. It's because the early church got this, and they did this. Even though they were being persecuted, they said, we're going to push through, we're going to love, we're going to serve, even when it's hard, even when it's inconvenient. Trusting that God is the one who's given us that power to serve. We're going to do what Christ has called us to do. They were ready. Oh, that we would have that same readiness to not just hope that God will come quickly and take us out of this world, but understanding that we've been left in this world for a reason. And we've been left to reach those who are perishing and without Christ. We're here to offer hope to those who don't yet know him. That's why we're still here, to love, to serve, and to live expecting Jesus to return. And it could happen any moment. Are you ready? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. And Lord, we, we understand what you're saying. We understand what you said through Peter, who, who knew you and who walked with you. We understand that you're, you're calling us to live holy lives. We understand that you're calling us.